part one. In this part of the test, you will hear short conversations between two people. After each conversation, you will hear a question about it. Choose the best answer to the question from the choices printed in the test booklet and mark your answer on the separate answer sheet. You should mark A, B, C, or D. There are 22 questions in part one. The conversations and questions will not be repeated. Please listen carefully. Now turn the page. Number one. I'm looking for the textbook for my physics course, but you're all out of the one I need. Could you order a copy for me? Sure. That usually takes about five business days, unless I have it sent by express mail, but that's going to cost you an extra $10. No problem. Class starts next week. What will the woman probably do? Number two. Do you happen to know the dollar to euro exchange rate? I'm not sure. Why do you ask? Well, I want to order a sweater from this catalog, but the prices are all in euros. Try looking online. There are plenty of websites that do currency conversions. What problem does the woman have? Number three. What did you hear about the job you applied for? You were perfect for it. They told me it might take six to eight weeks for them to make a decision. That seems like an awfully long time. I agree, and I'm not sure I can wait. Rent's due soon. What can be inferred about the man? Number four. Were you able to get tickets for the concert? I wish. All the cheap tickets were sold out by the time I got to the box office. The tickets they had left were too expensive. That's too bad. I know you were looking forward to going. I was. Oh well. I just waited too long, I guess. How does the man feel? Number five. Um, Professor, I was absent from class on Monday. I was wondering if I could get a copy of the handouts from the lecture. Of course. I'll be in my office today from noon until four. Drop by any time to pick them up. Did I miss a lot? Well, we covered most of what's in Chapter 6 in your textbook, so you'll want to go over that carefully. Why did the man talk to the professor? Number six. Are you okay, Steve? You look a little tired. I am tired. Very tired. I came in early for a conference call with the London branch. They could only meet in the morning there, and because of the time difference, that meant I had to be here at 4 a.m. No wonder you're tired. You should go home early then. I think I'm going to go home at about 1. What will the man probably do? Number seven. I'm terrible about paying bills on time. This is the second month in a row I've had to pay a late fee because I mailed my cable payment in late. You know, you can set up a lot of your bills so that the payments are deducted automatically from your bank account. I do that for all my utilities and my cell phone as well. It's really convenient and I don't have to worry about late payments anymore. That's a good idea. I never thought about that before. What does the man suggest the woman do? Number eight. 
I'm so nervous about meeting with the dean tomorrow. Oh, right. You're the new student government representative. Aren't you requesting money for the sports club? Actually, I proposed a new program to improve freshman students' experiences. The dean liked it and asked us to expand the plan. How about offering new students a campus tour? That map they give is hard to read. Why is the woman meeting the dean? Number 9. Taylor Office Supply has raised their prices again, almost 10% on most of their stuff. And that's the second price increase this year. I'm afraid it's time to find a new supplier. I've heard Office Pro has good prices, although their selection is a bit limited. But they might be good for ordering basic, everyday supplies. Should I have them send a catalog? Yes, that'd be great. What will the woman probably do? Number 10. How was that new movie you went to see yesterday? You know, it's really funny. When we got there, all the shows were sold out, so we ended up getting tickets for later today. Wow, I didn't realize it would be so popular. We didn't either. What can be inferred about the woman? Number 11. Does your boss know you've been offered another job? No. Should I lay my cards on the table? It might help you when you're negotiating. What does the man suggest the woman do? Number 12. I've been having quite a time trying to land a job. I've been looking for weeks. There's just nothing in my field listed in the newspapers. Do you belong to any professional organizations? They can be a great resource for their members. Actually, I do belong to the Teachers Society. I don't know why it didn't occur to me to look into that. How has the man helped the woman? Number 13. How much was that management course that you took last weekend? I'm thinking about taking it myself. It was just under $100, and I think it was worth it. Does that cover everything? Would I need to purchase books or software? Yeah, the fee includes everything. Two full days of instruction and a workbook with a CD that has all the lecture notes, examples, and practice exercises. What does the man want to know? Number 14. I like your new glasses. They really suit you. Thank you. And I can see a lot better with them, especially when I'm reading. But it's weird. There's a blurry, unfocused spot on the left lens. It doesn't look like they're dirty or anything. Sounds like something's wrong. I'd take them back if I were you. Have them make you a new pair. What does the woman suggest the man do? Number 15. Have you heard anything from John about his new job? Yes, he says it's a long commute, but he really likes what he's doing. That's good to hear. I know he was nervous about changing jobs. He told me it paid quite well, but he wasn't sure he'd actually enjoy the work. Well, it seems to have worked out for him. What was John's concern? Number 16. 
Tony, I'm starting to get concerned about your class participation. Just showing up isn't enough. You need to get involved in the discussions. But I do all the course readings and papers. I know, but you still need to contribute in class. Your classmates have never heard your thoughts on the topics. That's as important as doing well on the exams. Why did the woman talk to the man? Number 17. Have you heard the news? The mayor just resigned from office. Do you know who's going to take over? I hope it's someone with the same qualifications, because he was excellent. What does the woman want to know? Number 18. John told me you're taking a course in website design at the community college. Are you doing that for work or...? For work mostly. My boss wants an internal website for our department, and I thought this would be a good opportunity to learn some new skills, plus the company's paying for the class. What will the woman probably do? Number 19. How's selling your house going? Did that couple who was so interested make an offer to buy it? Actually, they did, but it fell through. After three weeks of negotiating, we couldn't agree on a couple points, so they decided not to buy it. So it's back to square one. Don't worry. It'll all work out. Why is the man upset? Number 20. Hi, Katie. How's your training going? Your big bike race is only two weeks away, right? I'm pretty sure I'll be ready. I've been riding a lot, every day after work and uh, taking long rides on the weekends. But I'm not racing to win, just to finish. Like a personal goal? Exactly. I just want to prove to myself that I can do it. What are the woman's expectations for the race? Number 21. You look upset. What's wrong? Did you see this month's schedule? The manager put me on for all night shifts. He knows I only want to work days. I feel like quitting. Don't do anything yet. At least wait to see next month's schedule. Maybe he couldn't avoid it this month. Oh, I hadn't thought about that. Maybe you're right. What will the man probably do? Number 22. Here are the first quarter sales figures you asked for. Thanks. Do I need to double check them? Or do you feel confident that they're accurate? Well, Joan put them together and Bill looked them over. And they're the two most meticulous people we have. What does the woman say about the figures? End of part one. Part two. In this part of the test, you will hear longer conversations between two people. After each conversation, you will answer some questions about it. Choose the best answer to the question from the choices printed in the test booklet and mark your answer on the separate answer sheet. You should mark A, B, C, or D. There are 21 questions in part two. The conversations and questions will not be repeated. If you want to, you may take notes in your booklet as you listen. Please listen carefully. 
Now turn the page. Numbers 23 to 26. Listen to a conversation about an apartment. Hi, I'm Steve Walters. I called earlier about seeing the apartment. Oh, hi, Steve. I'm Nancy. Come on in. Uh, sorry for the mess. I'm in the middle of packing everything up, as you can probably tell by all the boxes. Oh, no problem. Wow, this place is a lot bigger than I imagined. Most of the apartments I've looked at in this neighborhood are really small. Yes, this is unusually large for the area. And this is a great location, near the subway, the grocery store. Wow, and look at all the light you get in here. Those big windows. The last place I looked at today was like a cave. Really small, tiny windows, no light. Um, so how much is the rent again? It's 800 a month, but that includes gas, electricity, and trash collection. But you will have to pay for water. But that never cost me more than another $20 a month. That's a very good deal. Um, and uh, when would the apartment be available? On the 1st. As you can see, I'm still in the process of packing, but I'll have all my stuff moved out of here on the 28th or 29th. I hired a professional cleaning service to come in and scrub everything and shampoo the carpets and all that kind of stuff. It'll be like new when they're done and ready for a new tenant to move in on the 1st. Well, uh, come on. I'll give you a tour of the rest of the place. Number 23. Why is the man visiting the woman? Number 24. What does the man describe as a cave? Number 25. What is not included in the monthly rent? Number 26. According to the woman, what will happen soon? Numbers 27 to 30. Listen to a conversation between two friends. How'd your interview go yesterday? Uh, pretty well, except when they asked me what salary I wanted. I never know what to say to that. I mean, they're offering the job. Shouldn't they know how much they're going to pay? I know what you mean. It's an awkward question. Yeah, I mean, so if I give an amount that's lower than the maximum they're willing to pay, and they accept that, then I've kind of hurt myself. And if I give a figure that's higher than they're willing to pay, I just look greedy, you know? Exactly. You can't win. So, um, what did you wind up doing? I told them I was flexible, and we could discuss that later, once I knew a bit more about the job. And how'd they take that? They seemed to be fine with it. They invited me back next week. By then, I should have a better idea of what I want to say. Number 27. What are the speakers mainly discussing? Number 28. What did the man tell the company about his salary? Number 29. What will the man probably do? Number 30. What does the woman mean when she says, You can't win. Number 
Numbers 31 to 33. Listen to a telephone conversation. Hello, I'm wondering if it's too late to arrange for a next day delivery to Los Angeles. It's too late to schedule a pickup. Our drivers are already out making their final rounds. But if you can bring your package to one of our offices, we can still guarantee next day delivery. Okay, great. Um, where's your office? We have several in the area. Where are you? I'm on 53rd Street and 5th Avenue. Let's see, 53rd and 5th. Uh, one moment. Uh, our closest office is on 59th Street and 7th Avenue. And uh, they close at... They close at 6.30 this evening. Oh, really? Great. I have plenty of time then. I was afraid I wasn't going to be able to get this out today. Um, okay, well, I guess that's all. Thanks for your help. No problem. Have a good day. Number 31. What does the woman want? Number 32. What does the man tell the woman about the delivery? Number 33. Listen to a part of the conversation again, then answer the question. Oh, really? Great. I have plenty of time then. Why does the woman say, Oh, really? Numbers 34 to 36. Listen to a conversation between a student and a professor. Hello, professor. May I come in? Of course. What can I do for you? Well, the final's in two weeks. I was wondering if you might have a list of topics to study or old tests we could look at. I want to make sure I'm thoroughly prepared. I haven't prepared anything specific, and the old tests wouldn't help because the course content changes from year to year. Hmm. What do you suggest I do? Well, in a nutshell, you've got to be familiar with everything we've covered this semester. Go over the syllabus first. Make sure you're comfortable with all the topics on it. Then, if you find something you feel less confident about, go back to the textbook and handouts and whatever notes you took. I've pretty much done that, but there's so much. I was hoping to get a more specific idea about what to focus on. We've covered a lot of material this semester, and I guess I'm not sure what's really important and what's, you know, not. Sorry, but I can't help you any more than this. Number 34. What is the student discussing with the professor? Number 35. What does the professor say about the course content? Number 36. What does the professor suggest that the student do? Numbers 37 to 40. Listen to a conversation between two friends. So, did you ever buy a laptop computer? No, I'm still shopping around. It's a bit confusing. There are so many choices, and there's so much to read about. I want to make sure I get what I need, but I don't want to pay too much either. You do have a lot to think about. Mind if I offer some advice? No, that'd be great. Whatever computer you get, buy an extended service warranty. You know, when you pay an extra fee and the computer is warrantied for like five years? 
Then, if something goes wrong and you need to get the laptop fixed or replaced, and believe me, eventually something will go wrong, you're covered. That's a good idea. I hadn't thought about that. I got one when I bought my laptop. I hesitated about it at first, but then a year later, when my hard drive failed, they replaced it for free. Turns out, the cost of the warranty was way cheaper than buying a new hard drive. Well, now you've given me another thing to look into. Number 37. What does the woman recommend that the man do? Number 38. What happened to the woman's computer? Number 39. How does the man feel about buying a computer? Number 40. Listen to a part of the conversation again. Then answer the question. Then, if something goes wrong and you need to get the laptop fixed or replaced, and believe me, eventually something will go wrong, you're covered. What does the woman mean when she says, You're covered. Numbers 41 to 43. Listen to a conversation between co-workers. So, Stuart's retiring at the end of October. What are we going to do about replacing him? I guess we need to start interviewing candidates as soon as possible. Yes, I think we should get someone on board before Stuart retires. That way, Stuart can help with training his replacement. There's a lot to learn, and having some overlap with him will make things easier. I agree. We want to have as smooth a transition as possible. So, should I put a Help Wanted ad in the newspaper? Yes, and we should probably post a notice on the careers page of our website. Yes, definitely. I'll go talk to Mary in Human Resources and ask her how to go about doing all this. I'm sure there's some procedure we need to follow. I'm sure there is. Oh, when you talk to Mary, ask her for a copy of Stuart's job description. I'd like to sit down with him and update that. His position has evolved a lot over the last year, and I'd like to get all his current duties and responsibilities down on paper. In fact, maybe we should do that first, before we post the ad. We need to be clear in our own minds just what it is we're expecting from candidates. Number 41. What are the speakers talking about? Number 42. Why will the woman talk to human resources? Number 43. What does the man say he wants to do? End of Part 2 Part 3 In this part, you will hear some short talks. After each talk, you will answer some questions about it. Choose the best answer to the question from the choices printed in the test booklet and mark your answer on the separate answer sheet. You should mark A, B, C, or D. There are 17 questions in Part 3. The talks and questions will not be repeated. If you want to, you may take notes in your booklet as you listen. Please listen carefully. Now turn the page.
Numbers 44 to 47. Listen to a researcher giving a presentation to his colleagues. He is talking about a research study. I want to share with you a study we did on how teens use the internet to find out about music. We interviewed over 1,800 teens to ask them about their internet use, especially how they use the internet with regard to music. We spoke to all these young people face to face. What we learned is that teenage girls are more likely than boys to use the internet to research a musician or a band. Girls are also more likely to go online to listen to music and watch music videos. About the only music related activity that boys seem to do more of is downloading music to copy to CDs. Another interesting thing we found is that teenage girls who spend a significant amount of time online, uh, about half of them spend at least $100 a year on buying music, buying music from online retailers. These girls actually prefer to get their music this way rather than going to the store. In our study, we also identified those teens who are the so-called music influencers, the ones who other people turn to for advice or opinions about music, the ones who seem to know what's new or cool in music. Music influencers also tend to be teenage girls. And these girls spend nearly a third more money on music than average teens, which makes sense. They are influencers because they listen to more music. They tend to have a wide range of musical tastes. And because they're spending so much time listening to music, they wind up buying more music. Number 44. What was the research study about? Number 45. How was the information for the study collected? Number 46. What does the speaker say about teenage girls who spend a lot of time online? Number 47. What kind of people tend to be music influencers? Numbers 48 to 51. Listen to a manager talking to her staff. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for coming. I know there will be some questions about the new ID cards, so I thought it'd be best to meet and discuss the changes as a group. Okay, so I'll just jump right in. As of next month, we'll be using a new computerized system to keep track of employee hours. The system is tied into the ID cards you'll all be getting next Monday. So be sure to stop by the security desk on Monday morning to pick up your card. Okay, so here's how it works. Your ID card will have a magnetic strip on the back. We've installed card readers outside the building entrance. When you arrive for your shift, you'll need to swipe your ID card in the reader. This will do two things. First, it'll unlock the door to the building so you can enter. Second, it'll log the date and time that you arrived. This arrival time is what will be used to calculate your hours for payroll. You're counted as being at work from the moment you enter the building. Now, when you leave at the end of your shift, or if for any other reason you need to leave the building, you need to swipe your card again. So, just to make sure we're on the same page, you need to log in with your ID card at the start of your shift, and you need to log out whenever you leave the building. Okay, now I see you have some questions. Please feel free to go ahead and ask right now. Number 48. What will the ID cards be used for? Number 49. When will the employees swipe their cards?
Number 50. After the talk was finished, what did the speaker expect the audience to do? Number 51. Why does the woman say, So, just to make sure we're on the same page. Numbers 52 to 56. Listen to a tour guide in the city of Chicago. Good morning, and welcome to the architecture tour of Chicago. On today's tour, we'll visit some of Chicago's oldest buildings. We'll also introduce you to one distinct architectural style that shaped the city in its early days. Before we begin our tour, I want to give you some background information. Many of you know that Chicago suffered a great fire in 1871, and that's quite important when considering the architecture. The history of Chicago's buildings can be divided into two parts, before and after the Great Fire. Chicago is a relatively young city. The first buildings were erected in the early 1800s. By 1871, the city contained more than 50,000 buildings, roughly 17,000 of which were destroyed in the fire. This meant much of the city had to be rebuilt. Today, though, we'll visit some of the older buildings in the city, ones that survived the Great Fire. Many of the older buildings, like those we'll see today, are in a style called Italianate. Italianate was an architectural style that drew its inspiration from Italian villas. They have tall first floor windows, which allow the beauty of the interior to be shown off. One of the most defining features of Italianate style buildings is their low pitched roofs. I'll explain more about those later. You'll also have a chance to go inside two of the homes we see today to experience close up the unique style. I do hope you've all brought your cameras along. Number 52. What is the speaker's main purpose? Number 53. What is the main focus of the tour? Number 54. Why does the speaker mention Chicago's Great Fire? Number 55. According to the speaker, what will the people do on the tour? Number 56. What does the speaker mean when she says, One of the most defining features of Italianate style buildings is their low pitched roofs. Numbers 57 to 60. Listen to a professor speaking to her philosophy class. We've got just a few minutes before class ends, and I want to let you know about a public lecture that's scheduled for tonight in Dodge Hall. The lecture is on climate change and ethics. What do we know and what should we do? We'll be turning our attention to ethics in a few weeks, so I'm hoping if you attend this lecture, it is optional, that it'll whet your appetite for the subject. Dr. Stephen Willis, a professor from Central University, will be the speaker. He's a theoretical meteorologist, an expert on computer simulations of the atmosphere, and, and this is where he really diverges from most other climatologists, he's published articles in major philosophical journals. It says here in the flyer that, Dr. Willis will summarize key scientific findings. 
and he'll examine policy options and their ethical implications. That is, what we should do about them. I believe he'll be discussing the question of intergenerational fairness, fairness between generations. It's an interesting idea. We're used to thinking about ethics in terms of the here and now, and dealing with questions about the relations between living beings. But one of the questions Dr. Willis is going to ask is whether those of us who are living today have ethical obligations to those who will inherit the earth hundreds of years from now. Most philosophers believe, and I concur, that we do. And frankly, based on the work he's done, I'd be surprised if Dr. Willis thought otherwise. Number 57. What is the speaker's main purpose? Number 58. Why does the speaker think the event will interest the students? Number 59. What does the speaker say about future generations of human beings? Number 60. What can be inferred about the speaker and Dr. Willis? End of the listening test. In our study, we also identified those teens who are the so-called music influencers, the ones who other people turn to for advice or opinions about music, the ones who seem to know what's new or cool in music. Music influencers also tend to be teenage girls. And these girls spend nearly a third more money on music than average teens, which makes sense. They are influencers because they listen to more music. They tend to have a wide range of musical tastes. And because they're spending so much time listening to music, they wind up buying more music. Number 44. What was the research study about? Number 45. How was the information for the study collected? Number 46. What does the speaker say about teenage girls who spend a lot of time online? Number 47. What kind of people tend to be music influencers? Numbers 48 to 51. Listen to a manager talking to her staff. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for coming. I know there will be some questions about the new ID cards, so I thought it'd be best to meet and discuss the changes as a group. Okay, so I'll just jump right in. As of next month, we'll be using a new computerized system to keep track of employee hours. The system is tied into the ID cards you'll all be getting next Monday. So be sure to stop by the security desk on Monday morning to pick up your card. Okay, so here's how it works. Your ID card will have a magnetic strip on the back. 
we've installed card readers outside the building entrance. When you arrive for your shift, you'll need to swipe your ID card in the reader. This will do two things. First, it'll unlock the door to the building so you can enter. Second, it'll log the date and time that you arrived. This arrival time is what will be used to calculate your hours for payroll. You're counted as being at work from the moment you enter the building. Now, when you leave at the end of your shift, or if for any other reason you need to leave the building, you need to swipe your card again. So, just to make sure we're on the same page, you need to log in with your ID card at the start of your shift, and you need to log out whenever you leave the building. Okay, now I see you have some questions. Please feel free to go ahead and ask right now. Number 48. What will the ID cards be used for? Number 49. When will the employees swipe their cards? Number 50. After the talk was finished, what did the speaker expect the audience to do? Number 51. Why does the woman say, So, just to make sure we're on the same page. Numbers 52 to 56. Listen to a tour guide in the city of Chicago. Good morning, and welcome to the architecture tour of Chicago. On today's tour, we'll visit some of Chicago's oldest buildings. We'll also introduce you to one distinct architectural style that shaped the city in its early days. Before we begin our tour, I want to give you some background information. Many of you know that Chicago suffered a great fire in 1871, and that's quite important when considering the architecture. The history of Chicago's buildings can be divided into two parts, before and after the Great Fire. Chicago is a relatively young city. The first buildings were erected in the early 1800s. By 1871, the city contained more than 50,000 buildings, roughly 17,000 of which were destroyed in the fire. This meant much of the city had to be rebuilt. Today, though, we'll visit some of the older buildings in the city, ones that survived the Great Fire. Many of the older buildings, like those we'll see today, are in a style called Italianate. Italianate was an architectural style that drew its inspiration from Italian villas. They have tall first floor windows, which allow the beauty of the interior to be shown off. One of the most defining features of Italianate style buildings is their low pitched roofs. I'll explain more about those later. You'll also have a chance to go inside two of the homes we see today to experience close up the unique style. I do hope you've all brought your cameras along. Number 52. What is the speaker's main purpose? Number 53. What is the main focus of the tour? Number 54. Why does the speaker mention Chicago's Great Fire? Number 55. According to the speaker, what will the people do on the tour?
Number 56. What does the speaker mean when she says, One of the most defining features of Italianate style buildings is their low pitched roofs. Numbers 57 to 60. Listen to a professor speaking to her philosophy class. We've got just a few minutes before class ends, and I want to let you know about a public lecture that's scheduled for tonight in Dodge Hall. The lecture is on climate change and ethics. What do we know and what should we do? We'll be turning our attention to ethics in a few weeks, so I'm hoping if you attend this lecture, it is optional, that it'll whet your appetite for the subject. Dr. Stephen Willis, a professor from Central University, will be the speaker. He's a theoretical meteorologist, an expert on computer simulations of the atmosphere, and, and this is where he really diverges from most other climatologists, he's published articles in major philosophical journals. It says here in the flyer that Dr. Willis will summarize key scientific findings and he'll examine policy options and their ethical implications. That is, what we should do about them. I believe he'll be discussing the question of intergenerational fairness, fairness between generations. It's an interesting idea. We're used to thinking about ethics in terms of the here and now, and dealing with questions about the relations between living beings. But one of the questions Dr. Willis is going to ask is whether those of us who are living today have ethical obligations to those who will inherit the earth hundreds of years from now. Most philosophers believe, and I concur, that we do. And frankly, based on the work he's done, I'd be surprised if Dr. Willis thought otherwise. Number 57. What is the speaker's main purpose? Number 58. Why does the speaker think the event will interest the students? Number 59. What does the speaker say about future generations of human beings? Number 60. What can be inferred about the speaker and Dr. Willis? End of the listening test.